and allowed them to know we had advocates and the adults that are around them every single day. So I'm not a classroom teacher right now. I was a classroom teacher for 16 years, and um, in Seattle actually. And I taught um, first and second grade, and I taught middle school. And I left my classroom, I guess three years ago, like I moved to Shoreline. I didn't move to Shoreline. I live in South End, um, in Seattle, so I travel into Shoreline every day. And sometimes people ask me, like, isn't that commute like really, really long? And I actually moved even farther south a couple months ago, and so now it's like a solid hour. But um, yeah, but my friends, like I'm from California, and so I feel like an hour on the free was like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I put on my music and I'm really okay. And I, I get there and I feel like, yeah, this is why I'm doing this every single day. It feels real to me. But my journey to my position, um, which right now is Director of Equity and Family Engagement in the Shoreline School District, and it's a title that I feel very like proud of. Like there's no doctors in my family. I'm the first doctor. I'm the first, um, yeah, thank you. Like, I graduated um, four years ago, actually. So it feels really good like, to be standing here with that title, and I use it um, in very select spots, but when I use it, I kind of like lead with it. And so it feels kind of good. Um, I'm a graduate of HBCU, Grambling State University. I answer that because that's also part of my identity. Um, I'm from the Bay Area. I grew up in San Jose, California. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, and my family's from Louisiana, so I am a product of Southern, um, like black Southern, deep-rooted, sharecropper, like that is one side of my family. My other side of my family is native Irish black descendants. And the greatest pride in our story was that my grandfather was able to buy his way off the share, off the plantation, um, and grew out of the sharecropping experience to be able to take his family into like the little city next door um, but they built their house from the ground up, and um, all of those children, you know, went off to have these really great experiences. And my father was in the military, and we landed in California. Um, but because of those southern roots, I always knew, like, when we went back every single summer back home, like, that somehow the South was going to be a part of me. And so when it came time to find my school um, for college, like, I knew I was going back South. My cousins actually had... Um, dared me. Like, you're not going to be able to last in the South. In HBCU, like, you're not going to be able to do black college. Um, and I had a very multicultural growing up, so it wasn't like I wasn't around different people. Like, actually, that was my life. What I wasn't around was a lot of black people. And that's what I was desiring. That's what I wanted to see. And so Grambling, for me, and I tell any student that's ever looking for, like, a college experience, like, think about HBCUs. Like, that's not a school that is less than, it should never be diminished. We, some of our greatest black leaders come from HBCUs. And so um, it was kind of cool. We actually had a BSU assembly at one of our high schools, and I was mentioned as like being a, a proud, like you know, African American leader, Dr. Tanisha Brandon Felder from Grambling State University. And I was like, well, they actually like recognized that and they saw me, and that's kind of cool. But I feel like that's important because I also went to UW, and I also um, have like my master's from there, my doctor from there, and the experience was really different. Like I had culture shock when I left Grambling and came to UW. And it was the first time I realized, like, oh, this isn't everyone's college experience. Things can be really different. And so I sought out the multicultural education department as kind of like my haven. And it's there when I started realizing, like, my desire and my passion around teaching for my own. Like, I really wanted that to be my mission. So when I had my first grade classroom, it was always going to be about how the black and brown kids doing in my class. Like, every single kid was going to do well. But how are my black kids doing in my class? That's really what I want to know. I want to see those kids graduating and being successful, whatever that meant for them. I just want them to be happy and to enjoy school. And so for 16 years, that's what I did. I could make sure that like all everything I took in for myself, everything I learned about who I was, everything I did for my students was about trying to achieve whatever they wanted that to be. Connecting with families in ways that meant like going to, like, to their homes, hanging out with them at you know games, like really making those people part of my life too, because. Something about bringing, bringing your child into your classroom, like that's a gift. When someone like grants you their child for the day and says take care of them, like I never took that lightly. It's a gift and it's an honor. So I wanted to like honor them and honor that. And then um, my last year of teaching, and I kind of knew it might be my last year because I also was like, you know, my doctorate program and trying to figure out what the next step was gonna be. And I've always been a social justice focused teacher. Everything I do is always about, you know, how can I like, you know, change the world and you little agents of change can change the world too. Like that was my my desire, my hope. Um, but I also realized that like my classroom 
wasn't enough for me anymore. And the way that I saw, like, you know, what's happening outside my classroom and somehow, you know, sometimes that feeling like you can't do anything outside your classroom, which I'm so glad people don't like, believe that, right? But I wanted to like change a system. And I wanted to have a position where I could change a system. I didn't know what that looked like. And I never thought I'd be in Shoreline. Like, you know, I didn't really know where Shoreline was. I remember Brian <laughs> took me on a tour. Like here, like all the different places on my first day. Um, and, you know, I still don't ever really go north unless I'm going to work. But it's been really helpful to know that there are kids out there who look like me who are like, oh, like you're here? Like, where'd you come from? And what are you doing? And can we talk? And, you know, is it okay if I call you, if I email you, like whatever? And I can be a voice and a face for them. And I really appreciate that because the work I do is real and it's serious. And we're trying to change systems and transform things. And so, my position is like a title, but my job is still a social equity warrior. Like I really be about the racial equity work that we're doing so that kids can have different experiences. But I'm kind of here to talk about adults. Is that okay for today for a second? Because um, I brought, I was brought to this, this um, group. I have to say thank you so much. Um, I don't know where I am, oh, are, because I was like, I'm not a teacher, but I really, really need a group. Like I need to be in a group with people of color. Can I, can I join your group? And she's like, yeah, like, come on, we'll figure it out. And so for a year, like, I've been sitting in here, like, you know, trying to like figure out, you know, where's my space? And sometimes they have the admin break. I'm like, do I really want to go to the admin breakout? Like, I want to like, I want to be here doing this work talking. Like, I'm like, yeah, I feel like right, like, <laughs> like can we go, can we stay? Um, and everyone's been so gracious. But you know, the stories are real and they're consistent. It doesn't really matter where you are, like where you're located, like the stories are, the, are real and they're consistent. And so this is my story about my desire to see more black faces in Shoreline. So um, that started with um, the fact that I'm one of only, like, um, there's only two central administrators that are African American. Um, I am one of them. Shoreline is north, that direction, right? Not both direction. It's north. Um, and we have um, a reputation of being a really white district. And to a certain extent, that's really true. Our students actually are 48% um, kids of color. Um, it's the rest of our staff that isn't quite as reflective of our students. And so one of the first things I noticed when I walked into my office, like I'm always looking for you know, likeness, like we're, we're others, right? Um, and it was exciting to be able to find and kind of create this group, what I call it our, our Black Leaders Group last year. I found five of us who were in positions that were similar to mine or kind of like mine with the idea that either we worked with teams or we weren't necessarily um, we were able to have some flexibility to meet. And we met every single month and came together. And the idea was that we would find some similarities that we had and we could support each other and connect with each other and tell stories and, you know, if we needed to cry or laugh together, we had that group. And um, we had a really strong group. I mean, five strong. My son a really small number. I'm from, I taught in Southeast Seattle, so like it wasn't really a big deal to have five black people in a room or at any given time. Um, but that's not my reality anymore, right? It's like five people, I'm like, yep, I'm excited about that. So I got my five people, and um, I fell in love with my group. Like I wasn't expecting to like really attach and like connect with my group. And I lost three of my group out of my five um, over the summertime. And the part that was unexpected for me was the heartache that went with that. Like I actually realized, um, someone had asked me, have you had a chance to reach out to like this new person that came at the beginning of the year? <laughs> And I realized that in some way, like shape or form, like I was actually rejecting the idea of connecting with someone else again who looked like me. Because the heartbreak of like having to say goodbye again, like I don't know if I could do that, right? Um, and I like been really determined to stay in contact with the people who no longer are with us. And when I say they're gone, I they left the district. Like they're no longer even in our little circle. And so there was the heartache of like realizing that this year being a putting together a community that took care of each other, that loved each other, that supported each other was no longer there. And I questioned like, what, like, what was my role in that? Because like, I really am also really clear that there's a place, like there's a piece of whiteness that plays in me and my, and my position did not come by accident, right? Like I have to conform, I have assimilating to, in order to get to the degree that I have. Even a doctor degree in itself, like <coughs> there are lots of different kinds of programs, but let's just be real, like you have to kind of figure out a way how you assimilate and play the game in order to accomplish certain things. And I just really hope that my accomplishing that like, wasn't diminishing who they were, like in the process. 
And I also felt shame that I was there and they weren't. Like it didn't make sense to me. And so that really hurt. And so I kind of like came back to the school year with this really heavy heart. I remember actually we did like a, uh, some kind of like dance thing. The song was happy that we were dancing to. And I was so sad, I couldn't really like even dance. I love to dance, but I could not dance. And I was like, I can't be happy right now. And so it took me a second. It took me like some reconnecting with the people that I had lost to kind of say, okay, like, what should I do? Like, what do I do now? And I almost needed their consent to say, okay, it's okay to keep going because you're fighting for us too, right? So um, I questioned like, you know, my place, my space. And then I started thinking about, but in this space and in the place that I get to occupy, like there's so much power and opportunity with this. And I'm lucky I get to actually like train with our HR department. And that meant something to me because I mean, all of a sudden now the work that I was doing in this group to be really relevant, connect directly to the work I was trying to accomplish in our school district. And so um, I'm really excited. Three of the black candidates that we um, hired this year, with the exception of one, all were personally brought in from me. Um, and I'm proud because we don't have a lot of black candidates in our district or black um, employees. Um, so I would like to actually acknowledge the fact that we have a little group of black and brown people here in the room with us um, from Shortline. So can you please stand and like, they're not the ones that were hired, but they're, please stand <laughs> with them. Yay. The voices that each of these individuals have, like the reputation of fire when they walk into a room is like real. It changes the mood, it changes like the energy, and people are paying attention. So I just want to say thank you because it's really nice not to be by myself. Um, so the other thing is that my overall hope for like when we're all in this space together and we take it back to wherever it is that we're sitting and living is that we don't forget the power that we have collectively. There is just a power in being in a room with people that identify like you, that are close to you, that are next to you. Um, when I was taking in um, Mr. Lynn's story earlier, like I don't know about any of you, but like the amount of passion and emotion and like strength and like all of those adjectives, I couldn't even tell her in words like what, how much like her story meant to me because she carries a story for all of us. And I feel like we have a legacy like to create, to protect, like to, to take on. Um, if you know anything about me, I'm a Marvel fan, so I'm gonna, of course, like, make a Marvel quote, which is like, remember who you are, right? Um, that's what T'Challa's mother told him as he was fighting over on that cliff like, for his, his kingship. It's like, don't forget who you are. Remember who you are. You are a king. Like, you are a warrior. Whatever you want to identify yourself as, like, that's who you are. And so when we're out there doing the work, like, don't forget who you are. And if you ever forget, like, call people so they can remind you who you are because we can do this work better together. So I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to have space with all of you and share all of your energy and strength and loveliness. And um, I'm so glad I'm part of this group. Thank you.